We're both really excited to be here, delighted to be here, all of us, both virtual and actual. Um, and uh, Goncar Gyatso um, really is one of the most uh, world famous preeminent artists working today from a Tibetan historic background, but also contemporary background. And um, there's so much to tell about him, but the beauty of a great artist is how they speak through their artwork. So with no ado, we're going to make this very conversational by talking literally about the artworks that you see in the room um, and uh, then turning it over to converse with you about this amazing body of work. So starting with the beginning, um, can you tell us a little bit about who these people are? Uh, yes, hi. Uh, actually, this is the project I think I did uh, 2014. 2014. Yeah. And uh, uh, then the name of the project is called uh, My Family Album. And uh, apparently it's my parents and also my stepfather. And um, this was, uh, you can see it's part of a continuum because you can see the break there. And so we're going to go on to the next part of the continuum of the family album project. Uh, that is my son, my wife, and myself. He has that hat here today, but he chose not to wear it on stage at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and next? And uh, so basically we, we lay the people in, uh, according to their age. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's my sister and the uh, uh, brother-in-law and a brother and a sister-in-law. And these? And then, yes, uh, niece and her fiancé and the niece, her husband and the kids. Uh, then that's nephew and uh, his, uh, his girlfriend. Uh, that's also uh, one of the niece's uh, boyfriend. And that's also our niece, and uh, then that's also one of our uh, nephew uh, in the middle school. And uh, you can see that that's what's on the wall here, leading into this whole gallery. Yeah. And then, then I think uh, with this project, I think we also uh, what I did is uh, mm, made those people as a cutout. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something I. I kind of inspired by the uh, commercial mm -hmm. advertisement you can mm -hmm. quite often see in the airport or mm -hmm. in the, uh, or beauty salon, mm -hmm. and uh, so then they're all in the life size, and then in the cutout actually, every family member was wearing uh, three different uh, dresses, uh, their their working uniform, and uh, also their leisure. Uh, dress and also the traditional uh, dressing, so each person have a kind of different. That's what a that's what a kind of the real life I saw when I was in Lhasa. Yeah. And uh, tell me how you chose with them the clothing that they were choosing to wear. I actually, basically, I I I went through uh, with their permission. I went through the. Uh, word of, especially the ladies. You know? Ooh, went and through the closets. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I have to thanks for my family because they're being really supportive. Mm -hmm. And uh, first, of course, they were a little shy. But when, I mean, the whole, whole photograph took quite a few days, but in the end, everyone kind of getting better and better with the cameras. And uh, it, it was quite a meaningful project because uh, mm, as you know, I, I left Tibet quite a few years, uh, many years ago. Uh, then this project really gave me the opportunity knew more of my family, Absolutely. especially the youngster. Right. Because I, 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 I didn't really know them well. And uh, so that was, a, that was a kind of amazing uh, project, I think, work with your own families. Do they, do they all live in Tibet? Yes, they are, yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you raise your voice a little bit more? Okay. Because some of our audience is having trouble yeah. hearing you. Thank you. I know. I, my voice projector is a little. He has okay. such a beautiful, soft voice, but that is, that is <laughs> difficult sometimes in late in, in the evening when, okay. when, when one is uh, not mic'd up so yeah. loudly. So I would try to keep that close to, is my, that better? to my mouth. Yeah. Wonderful. 
So, um, so talking about getting to know the youngsters of your family, mm -hmm. um, so you've got this great skateboarder with his skull and crossbones. Yeah. Um, is that a skateboard that he is proficient at? Yes, actually, mm -hmm. he is. And uh, then uh, uh, he's still in the middle middle school, and uh, uh, I think in the cutout he was mm -hmm. even wearing the school uniform, mm -hmm. which is in China. It's quite a well known because uh, it's quite a uh, quite a baggy, mm -hmm. juicy baggy, it's baggy kind of yeah. very loose, and a uh, lot of the young kids they don't like to wear. But uh, when they go to school, they have to. But in this shoot, he want to put uh, his more trendy, trendy look. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, trendy look. And uh, and you also talked about the the postures that people were posed in. Yes, I I use a. I think uh, Katie is going to show you some photograph later with Tibetan traditional way of uh, uh, family uh, photograph. And uh, somehow, I, I, uh, when I thought about this uh, photo uh, project, I really want to, uh, I don't want them lined up and or sit on the carpets or in the f uh, uh, put some flowers in the front or, or tanka in the back. Uh, because that's not really uh, you see in in Lhasa nowadays. Uh, actually, in Lhasa, I think now uh, people have become very fashion conscious, and uh, that's why I thought it would be really good to uh, have some kind of modern contemporary post. And uh, then uh, I. Obviously, I went through lots of fashion magazines. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those posts, actually, we copied from those, uh, those magazines. Yeah. And uh, then I think my family did a pretty good job uh, <laughs> to <laughs> become a... Fashion models. Mm, that's it, yes. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, I was also delighted in looking through this wonderful album that you also chose to represent some of your... Uh, how diverse your family is um, and how cosmopolitan your family is yeah. in all of the different... Uh, clothes that they they already own and that they wear and how they project themselves in, in yeah. this way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, that's also one of the things I, since, since I've been living West for the last quite a few years, and then quite often I think you can see from a, a magazine or, or, or even newspaper or or even movies, when every time when they talk about Tibet, especially inside Tibet, I think they always portray the Tibetan as a nomads or or, or, or real kind of Buddhist. Or uh, then I think that's a uh, sure. I mean, there is still we still have a nomads, we still have a, a Buddhist, but uh, but there is also other side of Tibetan, which is quite often you don't see in the mainstream media. And uh, so that's something I always try to account, you know, say this is uh, something happening now. Right. In, 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 in Tibet, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so for example, um, this young man mm -hmm. um, here, um, tell me a little bit about him. Do I tell the real story or the... the, the... Tell the real story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, apparently he's... a. Uh, uh, he's a real military person, uh, uh, even have a little rankings because he graduated from university. Uh, then I was really wishing him to wear the uniform, but somehow uh, he's being told... Uh, so, like, so this is your father in your father's military uniform? That's it. But mm -hmm. it, that's, the, that's more like the antiques, you know. It's 1950s on the fi style. That's it, right. 50s style. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's... Uh, He's still in the military, so somehow he's not allowed to wear it. Then, then I say, okay, then can you help me to become a Muslim, Tibetan Muslim? And uh, so he happily did it. Because uh, the reason I want him to acting as a Muslim, because uh, uh, in Tibet, I think there is uh, uh, the marriage to Muslim or, or to Chinese or or even in my case to the Westerner, it's become more common now. And uh, so I really wanted to show the Tibetan family is not anymore the singular, and uh, there is more diverse. And then, of course, you can see that even more in the outside, in, di uh, in the diaspora, uh, Tibetan living outside. But it's also happen, happen in the 
uh, in, in Tibet as well. Yeah. And has happened for a long time. Muslims have been living in cosmopolitan Lhasa since the 7th century, since yes. the 8th century. And so yes. this is something that is less projected outside, and it's wonderful to see you call mm -hmm. attention to that in its current iteration, mm -hmm. but also fully knowledgeable that it's something that's been going on that's been a little shaded from yeah. the contemporary media, perhaps. I, I think so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, this relates to an, another version of your family album shown here. Yes, then uh, this one actually image is from last year uh, from the uh, uh, Art Basel in Hong Kong mm -hmm. uh, because my uh, family album is being selected uh, to participate in one of the curating projects called Encounter. And... Uh, since the space is very big, so we have to make it much more elaborate, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, then also uh, we we need to create a kind of background because uh, otherwise the figure will be get lost on the on that big big space. And then I kind of inspired by the you know the the kiku, which yep. is the Tibetan uh, big, do you say big tanga or yes. huge? Yes, so, so um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this format, um, there are these oversized tanka, usually applique tanka, that are so large that they are laid out on the sides of mountains or a special wall is built so that they're pulled onto the side of the wall. Um, and so this kind of oversized banner actually does also come from a Tibetan style tradition, but certainly looking very different than what how those uh, those earlier banners look. That's right, and uh, so that was inspired by by this format. But uh, uh, as you see, the inside uh, the image is uh, uh, much more uh, different, uh, so it's more connect to the contemporary contemporary world and uh, also. Uh, there is some connection between uh, to the figures. Mm -hmm. yeah. But also keeping the staging. So this part is part of the staging of the yes. piece with yeah. the blue and the green and the yellow bands. Yeah. yeah, then there is a lot of slogans in the Chinese, in the English, in Tibetan, all around. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then this uh, is a different iteration of that kind of portraiture. So instead of portraying yourself through your family, it's a portrayal, a self-portrait. Uh, then this is uh, uh, so basically. Actually, today with uh, help with uh, Catherine and Melissa, uh, all those project actually it's did uh, in Tibet. Uh, so that's what uh, we are going to focus today. And then this is also one of the piece uh, I did a uh, little earlier, a couple of years earlier uh, in in Lhasa, uh, because I couple of before uh, which is uh, in I did in a studio in London but this one is really uh, happened in Lhasa and uh, then the title is called uh, uh, my my identity number five and we're going to show you all five but we thought we'd start with this most recent one and come back to it so this is the most recent my identity and this is you in London or somebody Somebody in London. I Somebody guess. in London. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and then um, a projection of yourself as a refugee in India, a projection of yourself earlier in Lhasa, and a projection of yourself potentially back through a traditional mythic time uh, based on a historic photograph um, that happens to be in the Newark Museum collection. Um, and Newark is very proud to be among the institutions that have collected Gonkar's work, and we own this series of four images from my identity that is inspired by this historic photograph, which is one of the reasons why it's such a brilliant pairing with the Tucci exhibition downstairs. Um, but one of the things that I've always just been um, amazed by is your uh, ability to take this kind of a stage and just transform every detail from how you're choosing the walls and the sides um, to uh, the, the images that you're projecting so that each one tells many different stories within it, um, leading into the most recent iteration of that same story. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, uh, uh, somehow I think those detail will be, uh, especially, I mean, uh, when it's a photograph, it's flat and also in just in a, a 2D. So uh, try to deliver the message. Mm -hmm. I always thought the detail it's quite important, and uh, also I think uh, in in Tibet, uh, 
The Tibetan people are very uh, detail oriented. Mm -hmm. I mean, from their art and even their, their daily life. So they were always picking some of their favorite photos or favorite figures. Mm -hmm. Uh, put uh, put in the house mm -hmm. on the, uh, or on the furniture, even even into the shrine. Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, and uh, one of the things that Newark has in common with the Pitt Rivers Museum, um, which is a spectacular archive of uh, historic photographs of Tibet, um, but we also have many albums similar to his photo family album, but much earlier in history, where we know. Tibetan photographers who took uh, po portraits of people that they knew, um, both formal uh, portraits of rulers of regions, um, high-level individuals who are also staging themselves in a semi-shrine-like environment, um, military officials, so that's 1955 military officials, so it's not just a recent phenomenon. Um, also, Tibetans bagpiping for other uh, styles of military. Um, and family portraits that were this kind of stage family portraits, which were very much of the, their period because, of course, family portraits across the country, across, around the world, looked like this in that time frame. Um, dandies who were also striking poses, uh, individuals who were showing off all of their finery, um, aggressive men strutting their stuff, but also just very cool cats with, with, uh, with uh, sunglasses and, and hats. Um, and even uh, the, no the, the nomads, who, as you say, certainly are existing today, but with their cell phones and with, uh, with their Rolexes and not just a traditional image. Um, and, of course, shrine images. And so um, this kind of photography um, is something that's really informed your work um, and something that it's informed museum installations like we see below, um, including the Newark Museum even starting as early as 1935 um, in its 35 altar and its creation. Um, all the way through uh, deconsecrating an altar, um, leading to uh, the current altar that's in the Newark Museum, which leads us over to, you have to break in. Yeah, um, I think we're uh, about at the point where- We're switching uh, over we're, to- we're, switch, we're switching over to, to Melissa so yeah. that um, they have a chance to talk about Absolutely. the project. So I'm just asking you to kind Absolutely. of wrap up and that's, when you're that's ready. What, that, that's exactly okay. where we're headed now. Okay. <laughs> So uh, now we are at uh, Buddhist. moving from this kind of an internal museum shrine to your picnic and discussion with Melissa. Okay. So uh, Melissa, let's let's check and see if we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So wel welcome to um, to Asia Society. Thank you so much, <laughs> and thank you for everyone to hold us together. Rachel and Gunkar really were innovative and figuring out how to loop me in after my flight was canceled. Thank you. So take it away. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, no. uh, so are my images? They're shifting uh, over right now, Melissa. OK, fabulous. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those of you who can't be here, which is everyone there, unfortunately, uh, you can see I'm sitting in Gunther's um, installation called Buddha's Picnic. And he's created a very uh, immersive, experiential installation that asks the viewer, the, the, the gallery goer comes in, takes off his or her shoes, and enters this grassland that you see that I'm sitting in, uh, and can be a part of this installation, sitting in the spaces that are provided here. One can take of the snacks, they're sweet and savory snacks, uh, engage the altar by way of making an offering, um, and listen to the soundscape. I've had to turn it way down, uh, because otherwise it would have been just too conflicting in terms of audio. Um, but what Gongar has provided is a very layered and sometimes incredibly dissonant soundscape uh, where you hear music and um, uh, lyrical Chinese music, Tibetan music, and mantras. So this is me just explaining to you the space that I'm in here now in uh, Lexington, Virginia. And now to start a conversation with you, Bunker, um, I'm interested in the fact that you did create this, to what seems to me, 
perhaps the most immersive experiential installation that I know of any way of your work, where you um, provide these opportunities for people actually to eat, to taste, to feel, uh, to hear. And so it's a full haptic experience. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that a little bit, speak to what inspired you to, to move in uh, this direction. And could, could we advance to the second slide just so that we have, there we go. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, yeah, just Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, I, I and Melissa, uh, we started this project about two years ago. And uh, uh, then uh, during these two years, uh, I, I learned quite a lot about uh, uh, the shrine. And uh, mm, I, and I think, uh, as always, uh, because when I was learning Tanka and this time when I was learning about shrine, I think there is a, 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 a always a kind of a, one is kind of curiosity and also get knowledge. But at the same time, then back of your head, say, how are you going to turn that around into uh, something which is uh, my work kind of well known for, uh, which is more playful? And, mm -hmm. and also more accessible for for audience because after all, uh, the shrine, the Buddha, it's very religious uh, mm -hmm. figures. But somehow I'm always into the the the, the uh, actually I kind of uh, deliberately want to kind of uh, uh, make make the make the the the, the religious meaning less. Uh, so, so that was the challenge, and uh, then, then of course, I think we saw a couple of pictures before. Uh, I, 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 I saw actually the Tibetan uh, nomads and uh, even farmers in the summer. They, they, they go to a picnic. Absolutely. Then apparently they also uh, bring a, a set up a kind of temporary shrine. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of them are really temporary. I mean, just one picture, and then maybe a uh, couple of uh, uh, fruit, and then maybe a bottle of uh, wine or, or beer. And uh, so that's something really inspired me. I thought that that's the kind of the way probably that project should go. Uh, that's fabulous. Um, <laughs> could you go to the next shrine, to, to the next slide? <laughs> slide, Ryan. There you go, that's a close-up. And then the next one after that, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, okay. So, um, so I'm interested in the significance of the picnic um, and the way you combine picnic and, sh and shrines, which you were just talking about a little bit. But then you bring in majong on top of everything else, right? So it's already a sensory experience. And then, and then we have this very famous game, very fun game to play, which you see uh, Gonka is playing right here with um, some students from WNL, and they loved this experience. Um, so could you talk about that a little bit? You, you've already mentioned sort of accessibility and play, but if you wouldn't mind going a little bit into more detail. Sure. I think the Mahjong is uh, it's a very popular game in, uh, in China. And uh, and also in Tibet, and uh, then of course it's a it's a one of those uh, game uh, when people go to picnic and uh, any kind of leisure time, the mahjong's always there, and uh, so I thought it would be bring it would be interesting to bring that element into it. Then uh, during that two years. Uh, having a discussion uh, and learning more about the traditional shrine. Then in Chengdu, uh, which is where I live now, and then also I witness the, 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 the how easy you can now to build up a shrine, uh, because the, the all kinds of uh, accessory, do you, can, can I call accessory? You can. It's, it's available in the shop. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the middle of the Chengdu, we, uh, I always call Tibetan town. When you go there, 
uh, there is a shop selling all kinds of uh, accessory for 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 Buddha uh, for religious purpose, and uh, uh, then it's become a kind of very instant and also very quick, but at the same time also very commercial, and also become a very uh, e electronical. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, I mean, in old days. People have to uh, sit and read the mantras by themselves, but nowadays you you just buy one of those uh, butter lamp. Mm -hmm. Then some of them are amazing, so luxurious, you know, uh, flashlights and the sound. Then you you just press the button, then they will come out all the all the mantras you need. So that's what people do. They <laughs> press in the morning, then they go to do the daily thing. Mm -hmm. So. That's that's kind of replacement, which is uh, quite a quite unthinkable. Because uh, uh, I I did talk to uh, uh, Melissa uh, when when my grandmother she won the first uh, set up the first shrine, which was was the ninety I think late late eighties. I mean that took just a little shrine took us probably two three months to complete mm -hmm. because all those things. Uh, you have to uh, go to specialist people and uh, commission. And uh, then also there is no mantra reading, so mm -hmm. she has to sit there or or do it. But nowadays it's all, all, all become a so, so accessible. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I think also it's so easy to set up. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think, unfortunately, we can't see much detail. But I think Melissa has some picture of the yeah, detail for sure. If you go to the next slide, okay, so this is Gunkar uh, setting it up, and we see some of the altar uh, without all the lights on, and you can see that he very, maybe Gunkar, you would want to talk about why it's set on a box as it is, the uh, Natum. Oh, uh, oh well, I'm... Basically, I'm just follow what uh, what the people does. I mean, when they go to picnic, so they need a drink. So those are the those are the empty drop empty box uh, for I think it's a Tibetan Tibetan chung, and so they use to to live up the 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 try to show a little respect for the for the shrine because they don't want to live on the ground. So it's kind of ironic, isn't it? I mean. There Built is, on yeah. beer boxes. <laughs> That's it. <yes. laughs> and I, I, I kind of like that too. Yes. I love that detail. It really speaks to the conversation you're having with actual shrines. Um, and yet, at the same time, what we see is you doing right now collaging here on this this uh, altar, which is you know one of your most signature famous things to do. Can you go to the next slide? So here we have a section of, of the altar, a close-up of it, the one on the left and uh, the corner of it on the right, as you can see here. Um, maybe go to the next one, just so that we can... Yeah, OK. So can you still see uh, Xi Jinping here? Oh, yes. OK, OK. It's, it's not clear to me, but as long as you can. Um, so, you know, here Gonkar is, is, yes, doing his famous collaging and layering of images, both traditional and new pop culture kitsch, uh, using figurines, a Chinese version of My Little Pony, uh, and, and so forth, and advertisements for lipsticks, uh, medallions of religious figures, photographs of uh, Chinese rappers and pop stars, as well as then the, the image of uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping. Um, and this is, in many ways, for me, the um, one of the, the most powerful focal points in this installation. Um, and lots of people gravitate towards it. Um, and what they've been doing now is weaving their own offerings, which I, I want to talk to you about, too, in a minute. But I'm wondering if you couldn't speak first to um, this mashup of imagery that you've created, and if there's any, um, what guided you, if anything, what, what inspired this movement and layering of images 
And I think you know we can always go back to the previous image, or I think there might be another one uh, after this. So you can play around if you want to see if you want to go back and forth at all. Sure. Is that a question? That is a question. Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> right. So the real question is, what inspired your play at the shrine? What images led you, what, what led you to combine My Little Pony with Xi Jinping? Uh, okay, I think Little Pony definitely, uh, actually I, I did see some, some, some Tibetan uh, views. Basically the pony, I think here, acting like those two auspicious animals, which is you see in the, in the Tibetan uh, monastery, you know, those two. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know what you call that one. Yeah, that's what, a, that's what a, is acting as it. So there is always pair. Uh, yeah. Then there is also protectors, which mm -hmm. is used the, the those modern Japanese characters, very scaring one. Uh, right. So could we go back to see that? One more? Are they there? Yeah. It's, uh, okay. It's over there. So okay. he's, a, he's a one of the protectors. Uh, uh, okay. Actually, it's a Japanese kind of cartoon figure. Uh, it's very popular. Uh, uh, then I think uh, about the leader. Um, I mean, I have to be honest. I mean, I don't really see uh, there is a Tibetan shrine which is including uh, the, the, especially the uh, the leader right now. But I mean, there is a case of uh, Mao, Mao Zedong, you know, Chairman Mao's uh, image. Uh, associated with a shrine or inside a shrine, that was quite a common in in Tibet. I mean, even people hanging in their car because they sort of Mao would be protect uh, the, the safe drive. And uh, uh, so the reason I put a Xi Jinping, including his wife, and then some of the uh, internal, uh, what do you call it, the community member inside, yes. uh, because. You know, in China, last two years when I was there in Chengdu, and also I went to some of the Tibetan area, I mean, those images are everywhere, uh, in people's house, in the square, and uh, uh, it's everywhere. And uh, I, then I think there is a kind of, uh, even people's family, some people are really willing to put them up in their family, because she... Uh, does get quite a lot of respect from from Chinese people, and also you can hear from uh, Tibetan people. And uh, then, then there is a kind of two two way. One is willing. Then also there is a government uh, say you got to have this in house or in I mean even probably in the monastery you can see that too. So I I just sort of that's what I saw, and then I sort of it would be purpose even get into shrine because I mean he's uh, he's uh, he's been quite a popular uh, politician I think so far that's what I uh, witnessed past two two years and uh, then maybe later M, uh, Melissa will show some of the image of the umbrella so you can see the so, Chinese so, you, we, so in order to get on to the question and answer part mm -hmm. you've got five more minutes on on this part right. so okay. um, so do you want to advance to your next slide Yes, I do. If you could go forward and forward one more. Okay, so um, you said how you wanted to make this, in different interviews, um, make this uh, piece very accessible, which it has been. It's very successful here in Lexington. There are kids, everybody of all ages is coming, and, really, and from a, a great distance actually coming to engage this. Um, so while it's playful and um, engaging, there is this sort of political side. And then if you could forward one more and one more. Yeah, there's um, this kind of, uh, there's a backside uh, to all of this. And there's an image literally on the back of the altar 
Um, and could you speak uh, to that and the placement of that? And that, that could you go to the next slide then? I, oh, I see. Uh, that's the, yeah, that's a. Uh, Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. I, so, I mean, that's also the reality I, yeah. I, I see. And uh, so apparently the Dalai Lama's picture is uh, uh, in a lot of places not being allowed to uh, display in the public. But uh, Tibetan always have a way of uh, putting them, uh, but uh, nobody's going to see because they only knew. So in that instant, you know, they... They put the tanka on the back of the shrine, then it's always been covered. And uh, so I guess maybe sometimes they think, you know, mm, he doesn't need, uh, uh, I don't have to show that picture to other people. As I know he's there, then I think that's kind of, there is kind of this understanding. And then that's kind of the reality I, 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 I see in, uh, in, in Tibetan area, yeah. Excellent. And the last image, um, if we can advance. So bringing it back to my identity, uh, Gompar and I had a conversation the other phone where I was asking him if he felt that my identity, which was done when it, it was 2003, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, if in some ways this was the beginning of him playing with shrines, and I mentioned to him number three, where you see the refugee in artist uh, painting the image of the Dalai Lama and the Podola, and then you have the suitcase with uh, the devotional image of the Dalai Lama leaning against the corrugated metal wall. And, uh, and he said, yeah, I suppose so. And then he mentioned number two that you see, the cultural revolution figure with the Mao uh, bust Stacked, um, positioned on top of the uh, little red notebooks, uh, little red books of um, Mao's quotations. So you, um, I just wonder if maybe we would end with you talking about sort of these early musings about shrines and how you see this installation now perhaps relating or connecting to this material and also the, the piece that you did in Boulder in 2016, which I don't have a photo of, unfortunately. Oh. I, I was, oh, sorry, no, sorry. <laughs> go go ahead. Well, I was thinking if you if you advance because then of course the the most the next slide please. The right. fifth, mm -hmm. uh, again, next and again. Yeah. So uh, and then we have a full shrine there on your right, um, and we have that political picture that we see above. So maybe we would end there, Gompar, and we might talk about this sort of play with an, an, an artistic inquiry that you've been having with shrines or about shrines. Thank you so much. I think, uh, I mean, Melissa kind of did amazing research because uh, two days ago she said uh, to me, say, actually, Konka, you've been building up that shrine since 2003. Then I said, how? <laughs> so she, like <laughs> she noticed from those photographs. Then I sort of Probably yes. I think uh, even though I always keep telling that I don't know really much about shrine, uh, but somehow I think uh, I mean what we can see, the shrine is really part of the Tibetan life uh, because they always need something even during the Cultural Revolution. Maybe the Buddha is not allowed, but uh, they mm -hmm. they think Mao put there okay. with, with, the, with the red books also purpose, I think. So that's, uh, that's what happened. And then, of course, uh, I mean, one thing I have to say is when you compare those five photographs, you can really see how much the, the freedom now the Tibetan have, at least. You know, they, they, they have a, at least I think there is a quite a lot of accessible uh, accessibility to to get all those images and uh, all those information and uh, that's also I think the whole, whole I think identity series I want to show the Tibet is changing mm -hmm. it's uh, it's no longer the one we we know from outside and even I know I mean right. I was there 
Last time I was there, ninety-two. Mm-hmm. This time, when I went back, mm-hmm. it's almost like I've been to a new place. Right. I'm really starting from the scratch. Right. I mean, even my Chinese was, I sort of, I was really good. But uh, <laughs> I remember a couple of times young Tibetans say, mm, you spoke kind of old-fashioned Tibetans. Right. Or the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> so there is, you know, the, all the language even, even moved. Right. So it's a new place. It yeah. is. And I think that one of the things that connects both of the sides of this and that we'd love to open up, because it's not an ending here, it's actually a beginning of a continued conversation with you, um, is how um, 21st century is global and that all of these things are being updated for use in practice, whether it's the mantra on command by pressing the button and having the mantras rec- recited, whether it's the digital uh, disco halos that go behind a B- Buddha's head, uh, or whether it's a, um, uh, um, a brand new shrine with the best wood that's fabricated right in all of the shops that you can go to down sta- downtown to, to, to uh, purchase all the things that you need very quickly. Mm-hmm. So as we open up for questions, um, there are microphones, and if you could wait until you get the microphone before you speak, that would be great. And I'll try to look through the, through the spotlight. Um, um, so please just raise your hands, and, and we're happy to, to, to have this be a wonderful two-way conversation, or three-way or four-way conversation. Yes. Wait for, for the microphone, please. Right. Mm-hmm. One of the descriptions of your work was that it incorporated lights and and uh, electronic uh, uh, things, and we really didn't get the sense with this group of slides of where that happened. At least I I didn't. Uh, I mean, I have a feeling that your work is much sort of broader and larger than than what we saw. Is that true? And what kind of uh, electronic uh, devices have you been using in your recent work? Oh. Uh, actually, uh, the, the, I wish I could do something to the the, the electronic is uh, with the shine, which is right on the bottom of that umbrella, and uh, then basically it's a you can you can really buy them from the shops and then it's uh, uh, all different size and a different uh, kind of uh, butter lamp and uh, when you plug when you plug the electricity then the lamp will be uh, gathering and and also there will be uh, mentors or song coming out from that and uh, so when i say there is electrical gadget which means are uh, those one and uh, yeah Thank you. Thank you. So part, I'm wondering how, how you kind of uh, meld. Uh, your, I have a feeling you have a great sense of fun uh, as, as well as uh, a serious side which uh, explores your own uh, traditions and world traditions. And I think that that's something which a lot of art doesn't have uh, uh, these days. So I'm wondering... Am I am I right or not about that, that <laughs> uh, observation? I think your observation is hundred uh, percent right. Uh, that's something I I really believe. Uh, when I'm making art, uh, first I really want to make sure I'm enjoying doing it, because uh, 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 when I was uh, starting with my art career for a long time, I never really enjoyed it. It's uh, so so hard to making art and uh, but somehow I think around 2003 or 4 suddenly I have this revolution in my head and uh, since then uh, I never look back and uh, I always enjoying making it uh, then then of course this is uh, shrine is a uh, that's why I think it took me quite a long time to figure out this project because uh, at the beginning I couldn't even know how I'm going to enjoy making uh, this new shrine because uh, uh, it was, uh, yeah, so that figure out was kind of tough, but uh, when I'm making it, uh, it was much more fun. And then I really believe that. I think as an artist, you should uh, first uh, enjoy and also first you should 
inspired by your own work and inspired by the work, and then probably you can really deliver that into the people when they're coming to see your work. That's what I believe, yeah. Thank you. Yes. yes. You said that when you went back to Tibet, you were surprised to see a new Tibet changed. Based on your experience, do you think that Tibetan artists have complete freedom of expression and there is no censorship? I, mm, I, okay. Uh, I think when I say that, I have a comparison because uh, uh, I was born in Tibet. Uh, then I grew up uh, during the 70s the whole 70 and then whole 80 and the part of the 90s. And uh, compare that time, especially the 70s and early 80s, I have to say now the Tibetan, including the Chinese, they have much more freedom than, than the 70s and the 80s, early 80s. And uh, so that's what I mean. And then of course, we, we know some of the thing which is I'm not going to mention because I have to go back to Chengdu. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There's a microphone right there for you. Mm -hmm. having, having taught, I don't really need a microphone, but okay. Well, we, do, we need it for recording. Yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. The date of this last identity, when you the did The year it, you made this. I, I believe it was 2014 or 13, yes. And you are painting a portrait of? Aung San Suu Kyi. Yeah. Yes, I yeah. was pretty sure, but I wanted you to confirm it. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I know you touched a little on what a, a different modern world Tibet is now. And I know you're one of the faces of contemporary Tibetan art. I was wondering, do you ever feel maybe an implicit or subconscious pressure to show a Western world that is somewhat like fixated on seeing Tibetan as this traditional mystical land? Do you feel pressure in your artwork or otherwise to kind of prove otherwise? I didn't quite get it. Um, do you want to try to rephrase your question sure. slightly? Um, I feel in my experience that the Western world likes to see Tibet um, as sort of like a traditional mystic land. And a lot of us are like fascinated with that and want to know more. And a lot of the art, like Tonka, is interesting. Um, but for you, you know a very different Tibet, a contemporary Tibet where like young people are using social media, like the nomads are wearing Rolex, Rolexes. Do you feel pressure sometimes in your artwork to kind of show the world this is a contemporary Tibet and not just the traditional Tibet? Or do you kind of do, like based on your own personal interests, like what you would like to do with your art? Or do you feel that pressure, essentially? Actually, it's a good question. Uh, mm, maybe two way. One is my willing, then, then the other is uh, also, I really want to tell the, the, the real story. Uh, because when I say real story, it means now I'm, uh, I'm actually there and in China, in Chengdu, and also I can get to go to some of the Tibetan area much easier. And uh, so I want, to, I want to just share what I see, what I experience, and uh, a, so there is a there is a there is two uh, motivation on that, and uh, then also actually not just for for instance, I think those work also can be shown in China uh, because uh, uh, it's not just Westerner thinking of Tibet as a tradition and as a Shangri La. Now, I mean, in China, even the Chinese are really thinking of that and uh, it was amazed me and uh, so i i sort of i sort of we we got to i mean show 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 to the the people uh, then i i have to say i mean 
At the moment, I mean, I've just been there for two years, then I think my understanding of, uh, uh, of the place and the new, new Tibet or new channels are very limited. So, but anyhow, I was kind of just putting, putting out there for people. And uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, microphones, right? Gonker, when you look at the your great Buddha painting at the Metropolitan Museum, it seems to me you're taking the tradition of the Buddha and extending it out into all the cultures of the world. And I wonder how much more you're thinking when you're painting rather than traditionally with the different uh, Tibetan matters and whether you're, you're extending more out into the world, you've lived all over the world, and those paintings, those Buddha paintings, the paintings of the Buddha seem to me to be so broad-based intellectually and um, reaching out into the world. I wonder if you want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, yes, I think, uh, I mean, when I was doing those Buddha paintings, I, 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 I lived in the Chengdu, oh, sorry, actually I was in uh, London, and uh, then later, I, I I spent quite a few years in uh, 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 New York, and uh, uh, then then I think uh, I always I think my my work uh, does influence by the surroundings. I mean, when I'm living in uh, London, New York, I mean, we all know it's a, a very diverse and international city. And uh, uh, so that's something really reflecting in my Buddha's work. And uh, so now I, I went back uh, uh, in China. Actually, my real goal was going back to Lhasa eventually. And uh, so I think now that place probably really uh, kind of influence or 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 my work. And uh, so uh, then also I I I don't read that much uh, since my my English is not very good. And now when I went back to China. Mm, I mean the language has changed a lot. I think there is no a lot of new phrase which is. I even I don't understand, and uh, so basically, I I was using my eye to observe, uh, uh, using my observation. So I was kind of really following my own instincts. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think part of what you're really getting at, which is really brilliant, is that being able to. Oh, you can't hear. Okay. I think part of what you're getting at, which is really brilliantly explained um, by you just now, is that visual literacy, is that deep intellectual rigor is a kind of visual literacy that you bring to your work and that you translate into your work in a really phenomenal way. Yes. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's part of the audio soundscape from the shrine. From the shrine yeah. <laughs> I know it's been confusing. to ask a question, Melissa can hear you. So mm -hmm. Yes. She's involved mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. as well. Thank you, Grandpa Gatso. Um, I had the opportunity of living with a Tibetan host family in Nepal, and um, a lot of my classmates also had that same opportunity. Um, from my experience, the shrine room, even for foreigners like me, was not a room in which I could enter in a um, diaspora community of Tibetans. So I wanted to know if you've received any negative feedback from uh, Tibetans or anybody regarding the playful nature you've, t you've taken on with the shrine. Thank you. Uh, no, so far I didn't, I didn't really hear, hear any, any, any uh, feedback, yes, no. Uh, also, I probably I never heard, I, I never hear, because I mean, uh, Tibetans are pretty shy. Uh, uh, they don't, they don't. Yeah, we are. We always lack of uh, uh, um, how do you call it? Uh, the 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 uh, critics, which is uh, yeah, the Tibetan contemporary art. I think we need more critics, but somehow <laughs> we are really lack of that. And uh, I wish to hear some, you know, 
uh, negative stuff or, or some more constructive uh, feedback. But so far, not, not yet. Yeah. It's a wonderful phrase about the shyness versus the diaspora issue versus the, the in Tibet issue. Can you hear me? Can I make a point? Certainly. You, okay, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to, um, so it's interesting for me to hear that comment because in many ways, I've, I, in my experiences both in Tibet, in the TAR, and outside in China, Nepal, and India, um, the shrine room is really the room that is the showcase room where people are invited in because it's it's sort of the finest that people that that Tibetan families have. And so it's it's I'm a little surprised to hear that his experience was that it was off limits. And um, and I, I just I wonder about that. I, I had a research assistant uh, this summer who was in Kathmandu and went to a number of um, uh, nunneries and monasteries and people's homes to document uh, these shrines. And never did she run into a problem like that. Um, so sort of interesting to, to hear that and very unexpected. For, well, for but, I, but I also think that some of that is the difference between living in a house where you have potential access to the room versus visiting for a documentation part where you're kind of chaperoned in that room. Um, and you want to respond to that? Uh-huh. Uh, can we get the, the microphone? Mic, the mic so that Melissa can hear you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry if I misspoke. It's not that it was off limits, but um, I was sleeping there in their home for over two months. So it was, I couldn't sleep in there. I couldn't um, eat in there. But I was allowed in there. There um, you go. Thank you for yeah. clarifying. So the, living, the living experience okay. as opposed to the research experience may um, have had some differences. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Yeah, I have a question, uh, Gankar, about uh, the creative process of creating the family album. And, you know, a lot of the, uh, it's clear there was a lot of planning and the, and, and the execution, and it's, it's evident in the photography and the staging and the design, um, which required a lot of thought. Uh, uh, obviously, and I was fortunate enough to be able to walk through the exhibit when it was up in uh, in uh, at Emory. And one thing that struck me after a couple hours of walking through and looking at the images is that the face of each family member was very different depending on the costume that they were wearing. And to me, some of them were actually unrecognizable from one person to the other. Is that something that you anticipated, or is that something that just spontaneously emerged from the creative process? Uh, I think it's kind of emerged uh, because uh, uh, one of the things I uh, forgot to mention is uh, each time when they change the change the clothes, then we also uh, change the hairdress. So when we during the shooting, I even have a, a, a hairdressers and uh, a makeup artists. So, uh, I mean, that's also the re- real thing in, in, in Lhasa or in Tibetan uh, society. When you wear a Tibetan uh, costume, then especially for women, your hair has to be done in a different way. But when they're going to go to work, then they have to all maybe tied up. And uh, so, so yeah, there is uh, that kind of process. Probably that may causing the, you know, the, 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 the changes, I think. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I, I think it's quite, a, quite a interesting, too, for myself. Thank you for the question. Gunkar Gyatso, Catherine Paul, and Melissa Karen, thank to all of you for such an engaging program and um, thanks to all of you for coming tonight and joining the discussion. Have a good evening.